Welcome back to Daily Standup. This one I'm just going to go right into it. So I'm going to show you my Rust microservice. And if you actually look at the bottom, you're going to see the console logs from uh, the first successful connection to my RabbitMQ server. So basically this is me posting a message um, to my RabbitMQ uh, server and then this Rust microservice processes the incoming messages here and then post them to the console after it um, unwraps the message and then can decodes it so before I was getting really tripped up because the messages were like encoded um, so it was like brackets numbers and then the full encoding so I had to decode it and I managed to get that to work using this from UTF-8 decoding and then pass the um, unwrapped data, but then you actually have to explicitly call data. So there's a lot of nuances to this, um, but I'm gonna show you it up and running. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this, and then it's going to start, and you can see waiting for messages. So it's successfully connected to my RedMQ server, which is running here on port 15672. And if I go over to Postman, like you see here, I'm actually going to send some messages. So I'm just sending some data through the engine. And if we go back to my Rust microservice, actually here you can see them. They got sent to the queue. You can see that unacknowledged is zero, which it should be because I've acknowledged the messages. And if we go to my Rust microservice, you can see the messages have processed here successfully so message ID if we take that we go back over my payload um, oh sorry that's actually from the uh, RabbitMQ message itself I need to go to uh, engines detail ID is that yeah engines detail ID I think that might be it's hard to match up. Uh, B49. B49. I forget if I'm posting different um, messages each time. Is this actually I'm trying to make sense of? Oh, I might be. Um, let me go to my. Actual, do I have the API running? Hopefully, I have so many things running. <laughs> um, let me see. That is the front end project. I have it running somewhere. Oh my goodness. Okay, right here. I'm going to set a breakpoint so I can show you what's actually happening as I'm hitting it from Postman. So I hit send, it'll hit the breakpoint here. Okay, this confusing, but I'm actually creating a fixture with my more fake data just as an example so we're going to step over that at this point it's actually going to publish this new message so if we look here we can get the um, let's get the engine ID so E what is that E9C127 and then we're going to publish it to the queue and if we jump back to the Rust microservice what did I say that was? E engine ID. This is really hard to read without it being formatted. Um, this is almost impossible to find because it's going to be somewhere engine. Uh, engines API engine because I think that's the last one up there because it's not the same ID. Well, let me post another one. This is crazy without it formatted. Okay. Is this actually, okay, so that's good there. 
yeah, the, I'm going to have a hard time finding the ID. But you can kind of see the flow running. Uh, once I get it formatted after this video, I actually will uh, hopefully post a better example. But I just wanted to show you my Rust microservice up and running. It's able to consume messages off my queue. Um, and so back, I think maybe a stand up or two ago, I showed you a couple errors that I was running into. Um, let me show you some updates that I've done since then. I don't know if it makes a difference just because again, I'm not a Rust developer yet. All right. I'm still, I'm still, still getting there. So I didn't change any of this. I added this Tokyo stream dependency, but to be honest, I don't even know if I'm using it, but that's, again, that's just something I changed. Um, let me go to, again, my main file. Um, so before I didn't even have this until today, this process, and this was left the same. The issue I was running into was the actual connection string. Um, and what I had to do was something was not working and I couldn't figure out why, because where I was getting hung up on was the fact that I didn't know that you can see here, localhost 15672, and if we go to my Rust microservice, I also tried using 15672, but I actually had to change that to 5672 because I didn't know that the, um, if you go to where I have that, um, set up in my Docker compose, what I didn't realize was that the port for 15672 is actually just specifically for the management um, UI for RabbitMQ, and I didn't, I was not aware of that. So I thought, I thought that would, I, I don't know what I thought that was, but make sure you're on the right port. Um, I don't know if it'll let me navigate here. Okay, yeah. So five six seventy two is the server, whereas one five six seventy two is actually just the management UI. So if that trips anyone else up, um, I know I saw one of you comment and I think I actually responded to the comment before I figured this out, but I'll probably edit my or delete my comment because you said, is it, you know, is it actually listening on that port number? And I really thought it was because I'm like, okay, you know, I use that as my connection in my .NET application. Um, but something must be happening elsewhere in there because evidently that can't use the management um, port number. So I don't know if anyone else runs in, runs into that issue as well. Uh, make sure you, this is correct here. Um, I don't think I had to change anything else. One thing I was having trouble with actually was that I, I looked at several examples of consuming messages and some of them gave me errors specifically here. Um, like I couldn't just copy and paste a couple examples I saw. Um, which is a little problematic because I don't know enough to know what's what's happening. And it's very unclear that you have to unwrap the message once you consume it and also decode it. And none of the examples I found, at least in printed form, I, I, saw, I, I saw a YouTube video where he had it decoded, but like two write-ups had near identical code uh, and none of them included decoding the message back from RabbitMQ. So if you don't do that, you, you, you can acknowledge that you received the message, but you can't, you, functionally, you can't do much until you decode it. So, um, and then also this, this here, sending a basic knowledge back to the channel. Um, I, I found very sporadic information about that. as well as there was something else and I can't remember right now, but um, again, I'm sure this, imp this implementation is not exhaustive by any means. This is just to get my prototype up and running as a proof of concept to know that I can connect to my RabbitMQ server and um, it'll, it'll successfully connect, which it does, which I'm really excited about. Again, there's, I'm, I'm sure I, I'm sure I'm doing like 50% of this wrong, but uh, you know I just I, I wanted 
to the first step is make a successful connection to RabbitMQ. So I feel like I did that. Now I can kind of, you know, add on to this and actually improve on it and everything. And actually start to make my, uh, the, the processing of the actual data. Um, and once I feel like I've gotten that, I really want to see how fast this is. So I'm going to basically spam my uh, queue with as many messages as I can and see how fast Rust can keep up with um, those messages. That's really what I, what I want to time, right? So I need to identify what the bottlenecks in my system are going to be. And I have a suspicion that my... Um, my .NET endpoint is going to be my main bottleneck where messages are actually being sent to the queue. And if that's the case, then I might need to reconsider what's going to publish my messages from my front end. Um, but we'll see. Again, we'll see. I, I'm using JMeter as my load testing um, software. Um, but yeah, I just have... I think, I'm, I think that's going to be... <clears throat> biggest bottleneck of my system because I really want to see what the limits of Rust are. Everyone says it's really fast so I want to see how fast I can consume messages from RabbitMQ and I will find out for sure. Um, so once I feel like I have this up and running here, let me actually pull up the sprint board after I've just like hopped around to a million different tabs but that's what software development pretty much is. <laughs> This funnels into my prototype backend consumer, so I'm actually going to add a note here. Um, have notes made successful connection to RabbitMQ, and then I still need to add logic in for data processing. Uh, I think I'm going to keep it light, um, light at light at first. Probably just um, uh, I pr probably will literally just probably read one singular field, and then probably make some kind of just um, if condition on that, and and do something according to that. Just just to kind of test out right reading, uh, you know. Consuming, reading, and then making a uh, a logical decision based off that, just to see how fast it is. So probably just read uh, one field at first. Well, I don't know what that's going to be yet. Um, maybe like I don't know the, uh, the bore size or something like that. Read one field and uh, perform a single if condition and print out results so that's kind of once that's kind of my main goal and then once i once i have that i can start load testing cuz that's really the main reason i picked rabbitmq or, or rust was because of how fast it is and how many messages that i, I foresee sending to my queue um, so again, once I have this up and running, once I've load tested this, then, and this is all going to be part of the same ticket, then I'm going to start working on my Python microservice. So it's going to be pretty similar work, um, trial and error. Uh, I'm going to make another, I'm going to make another ticket for Python, um, which I've used Python before. So hopefully there's not going to be as steep a learning curve. Um, and I'm planning on using uh, PyCharm probably as my IDE for Python. I find it's the easiest to get up and running with Python. It makes your virtual environment for you and handles some things out of the box. And it gives you some uh, basic help for syntax and things like that. So I think that's what I'm going to I'm gonna use. Um, and then it's that, again, that's going to be explicitly handling my temperature curves. So I'm just going to basically install... Um, the, the Python uh, math uh, libraries, uh, again, I forget what it's called, for charting. I've used them once, and they work uh, they work really, really well. They make, can make really cool um, graphs. The one decision I'm going to have to make for sure, though, is 
how often I'm going to be re-rendering the graphs. Obviously, they're not going to be continuous, but I'd like them to be as near, as, as, as real-time as possible, whatever my system allows. So if I'm, if I'm flooding the um, queue with, you know, a thousand messages every 30 seconds at, on the small scale there, um, I like for my graph to be indicative, you know, as close to real time as possible as, as to what temperatures are actually, you know, you're, you're seeing real time. And once I start ticking up to the millions uh, per minute, um, obviously there's going to be some latency, latency on that graph, but, um, I don't know if I need to make it like, like a UI rendered, um, with like PyKit or something that I can click a button and then instantaneously re-render. I might have to go to that route if it becomes too, if it, if it becomes too laggy. Um, if, if I have to do that, you know, it, it, so be it, but I really would like it to be, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of decisions I have to make with this. Uh, I have to, I'll have to render it somewhere. So yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure where I'm going to render it yet. But I know I'm going to use Python for it, so <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at. But that that'll be included in the in the research for sure. Um, I wonder if I can. Now I'm thinking about it. I wonder if I can somehow. I feel like that'd be so slow. I, what I was going to say was, I wonder if I could somehow return like an encoded version of the graph back to another RabbitMQ um, um, queue and like consume that from something else. Because I don't really want to create a dedicated like additional UI for the graphs. Huh. I might have to, I might have to think about that. I don't, I've never heard of that being done. I'm not sure. Uh, would that work? Would that work? Has anyone done that? Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like re like rendering the graph or not rendering, but I guess creating the graph in Python. And then I wonder if there's like a way to compress that data down into like some kind of encoded format, like essentially convert it to an image and then maybe compress it uh, and encode it to like UTF-8 or 16 or something and then send the encoding over to RabbitMQ and then decode it um, back on the front end side. Just with like a background service running or something. I don't know. I might have to look into that. Um, but anyway, that'll be covered and we'll have content on it. So uh, anyway, this was today's and I will see you on the next one.